I'd like to welcome you to our services. We're going to continue our study in Hebrews. If you'll open your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 7. I always want to point out, I want you to remember that this book was written to Hebrew people, those who had professed faith in Christ, and we've talked about how difficult it must have been for uh, these people back in the first century to have to say goodbye to a religious system that they had known, not only all their lives, but for for many generations, that they were to leave that behind and go on to something new. And for centuries, they had been accustomed to their priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, the high priest of the family of Aaron. This is what God gave them. This was a, all God himself had set this up, the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood. But now because the Messiah came and died on the cross and established a new covenant. Now they're told that the old way is over and there is a new way. There's no need for an old priesthood. There's no need for sacrifices. The temple would be destroyed by A.D. 70. And that was hard for the Jews to accept. I can understand that. Could you? something that they've known for so long and now uh, that has passed away and now they're being told that you don't need an Aaronic high priest. We have Jesus as our high priest and we are a believer priesthood. Now their objection would be, well, how can Jesus be our high priest? He's not of the family of Aaron. He's of the family of David. He belongs to the kingly lineage not the priestly lineage. And there were things like that that, that uh, confused them and, and disturbed them. And that's what he's addressing here. Remember, he, he touched on this back in chapter 5. Then we had that uh, parenthetical passage where he talked about the need to, to grow and mature. Now he's coming back to his subject on the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to show how Jesus can qualify to be our high priest and the high priest even of the Jewish people. That was brought up back in chapter 5, verse 10. Now we come back to it. And he introduces this person, Melchizedek. And he's going to show that Jesus is a high priest after the order of of Melchizedek. So let's read the first ten verses in chapter 7 for our passage tonight. He said, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. And he's talking about Melchizedek. He goes on to say, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And barely they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted, again talking about Melchizedek, not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Look at verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he liveth. 
And as I may so say, Levi also who receives tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So let's think tonight about this mysterious Melchizedek. Who in the world is this guy? There's a lot of uh, ideas about Melchizedek. He's only mentioned three times in the whole Bible. He's mentioned here and twice in the Old Testament. Go to Genesis 14. Let's just note the first mention of Melchizedek. When he meets Abraham, remember if you know your Old Testament, uh, Lot had moved to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were conquered by the alliance of kings, and Lot and many others were taken away captive. Abraham got his men together. They pursued. They defeated the alliance of kings and returned the spoils that had been taken. On their way back, they meet this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which will later become Jerusalem. Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. Look at Genesis 14, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and other kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies to thy hand. And he, Abraham, gave Melchizedek tithes of all that he had. So here's the mention of this man, Melchizedek. He's mentioned again in Psalm 110, verse 4, in a prophecy by David, where he said, The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That was talking about the Messiah who would come. The Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now Paul in Hebrews refers to these Old Testament mentions of Melchizedek and is now going to explain to them how Christ can be a high priest. See, there is a historical mention of Melchizedek in Genesis, a prophetic mention in Psalms, and now a doctrinal explanation in Hebrews. Folks, Melchizedek was an Old Testament type of the Lord Jesus. He was a picture of Jesus. We see many of them in the Old Testament. So he's a priest after the order of, of Melchizedek. He is a priest like Melchizedek was a priest. Now, forget, when you look at verse 3, this throws a lot of people, doesn't it? What in the world? Without father, without mother? He didn't have a mom and daddy? That's why some think, well, this is Jesus. Jesus came in the form of man and was known as Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. That's got to be Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. What he is doing is showing us that Melchizedek was a priest, but not like the Levitical priest. He was a priest ordained of God. The same as Christ is a priest ordained of God. Let's look at this. If you want to take notes, first of all, let's note the prerogative of Melchizedek. He has a double rank here of king and priest. That's a problem right off the bat. No Hebrew could ever hold the office of both king and priest. Again, the priest came of the tribe of Levi. The kings came of the tribe of Judah. There was one king at tribe. Remember Uzziah? King Uzziah was smitten of leprosy because he tried to assume the office of the priest. He tried to combine the two, and God judged him, didn't he? That's what happened when they tried to combine them. The only time we're ever going to see a correct joining of the king and priesthood is in Jesus Christ. He can 
be both. And He is both. He is king of the family of David. He is priest as Melchizedek was priest. As a king, he has power with men. As a priest, he has power with God. So he is our king and our priest. And that character was seen in Melchizedek. When he met Abraham... Abraham acknowledged that Melchizedek was superior to him and he gave of his tithes to this man and he called him by these titles, King of Peace and King of Righteousness. Again, a type of Jesus Christ who would fulfill that. Then note the power of Melchizedek. When he met Abraham, now Abraham was at the zenith of his influence and, and of his power. He had just defeated a, a mighty coalition of kings. He had been blessed of God. He was a mighty man in that area. But when he met Melchizedek, he immediately recognized this man as being a man of God. Now, I wish we had more information about Melchizedek. Evidently, Abraham knew about this man. I don't know if he'd ever met him before, but he knew about Melchizedek. And that shows us, folks, Abraham was not the only believer on earth at that time. There were others who were true believers of Jehovah God. Melchizedek was one of them. And Abraham met this man, and he recognized him for who he is, and he reverenced this man a type of Jesus Christ. For in Jesus, righteousness and peace have come together. But think about it. At Calvary, through the Lord Jesus Christ, God provided men with an enduring means of righteousness and an endless measure of peace. The Bible says that these two, righteousness and peace, kissed one another. That's in Psalm 85.10. You ought to write that verse down. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Folks, they did that in the Lord Jesus Christ. He brought this together. Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The role of every Old Testament priest was to show people how to be righteous were right with God. That was their function. Showing people how to be right with God. And if you're right with God, that's going to be, bring peace into your life. Hey, you're not going to know peace until you're right with God. Amen. Then thirdly, notice the person of Melchizedek. Going back to verse 3, this man is introduced suddenly into the Bible narrative. And when you read Genesis, the one thing you read is the genealogies, right? Genesis is full of genealogies, all that begetting that went on. But here is Melchizedek. There's no record of his birth, of his death. They talk about so-and-so was born and he lived and died. Not Melchizedek. There's no record of Melchizedek, his birth or his death. He, in that sense, he had no beginning of days or ending of days. So, are you saying he didn't have any parents? Of course he had parents. He, I didn't find him under a rock. He, he was a real man. He lived. Is, he's not an allegory. He's not a parable. He's not a mythical character. He was a real character. He really lived. But what he's doing here, folks, is he is showing how Melchizedek was different from the Levitical priesthood. The Levite had a beginning and an ending. Their mother and father, you had to have a record to be a Levite, to be a priest, who your parents were. Because your right to be a priest was passed on from generation to generation among the tribe of Levites. 
So your, your father and mother was important. You had to have a genealogy. You had to have a beginning of days and an ending of days as a priest. The, the Levitical priest, at the age of 25, became an apprentice. For five years, he would serve as an apprentice. At age 30, he would enter into his duties as a priest. At age 50, he would retire. They had a beginning of days as a priest. They had an ending of days as a priest. But not Melchizedek. His being a priest had nothing to do with who his mother and father are. He did not have a beginning or ending. He was a priest ordained of God without limits. Now keep in mind, Melchizedek lived before Moses and Aaron. Remember Abraham, if you know your chronology of Bible characters, many years after Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the long period of captivity in Egypt, then Moses is born. Hundreds of years after Abraham. That's when they received the law, when they built the tabernacle, and they received the priesthood. There was no priesthood until then, like the Levitical priesthood. That was given to Israel, right? Israel had a priesthood, and they had a high priest. But long before that, there were others who God ordained to be priests, men like Melchizedek. He was not an angel. He was not a pre-incarnation of Jesus. He was a real man, a real king, a real priest in a real city. But the application's clear. Folks, neither Aaron nor any of his descendants could claim to be without genealogy. They could not claim to have a continual ministry. They could never claim to be both king and priest, as Melchizedek could. So Paul's trying to get them to understand Jesus is qualified. Jesus has a claim to be your high priest. Then Number four, notice the preeminence of Melchizedek. Two things I want to point out here. First, I want you to see what he expected of Abraham. When Melchizedek met Abraham, Abraham gave him tithes. And Melchizedek accepted those tithes. He received the top of the heap. He received the pick of the spoils. He, he wasn't getting the leftovers, was he? Abraham gave, gave him the very best of what he had. And under the law of Moses, the Levitical priesthood received tithes from the other tribes. Now keep in mind, when they went into the promised land, there were actually 13 tribes, because Joseph's tribe was divided into two tribes, but his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there were actually 13 tribes. Only 12 tribes got possession of the land. The Levites did not receive a portion of land. They were the 13th tribe. They lived among the other 12 tribes in various Levitical cities. But they didn't have a possession. So the other 12 tribes would give their tithes, a tenth of what they got from their crops and from their fruits and all that. They would give a tenth of that to the Levites who had no land. So they receive the tithes. Now, notice what he's saying here. Abraham gave those tithes to Melchizedek. And the argument here, Melchizedek was greater than, than Abraham because it's always the greater who blesses the lesser. And we're talking about his office. The office Melchizedek had is king and priest was greater than anything Abraham had. Everybody see that? He's trying to make a point here that even the Levites later on who came out of Abraham's loins through his great-grandson Levi, they in effect paid tithes to Melchizedek through their ancestor Abraham. 
So he expected this from Abraham. Then we notice what he extended to Abraham. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. The Levitical priests still in the loins of Abraham were blessed by Melchizedek. Consequently, they were inferior to Melchizedek. See, Paul is showing that Melchizedek's lordship and preeminence cannot be contradicted. He pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me point out something here, by the way. There are people that want to argue that we don't have to pay tithes because that was given to Israelites. Only the Israelites were expected to give tithes. We are not expected to give tithes. Well, look at this. He talks about the Levites who receive tithes. Verse 8, here men that die receive tithes. He's talking about those Levitical priests. And that was still in effect when this book was written and being read, first of all. Those Levitical priests were still acting and performing their duties and receiving tithes. Here they receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Who's that? Folks, oh, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Who, who do we witness that lives? Jesus lives. He died on the cross, he was raised from the dead, and he lives forevermore. This says Jesus, our high priest, receives our tithe. When you give your tithe, you're not giving it to me. You're not even really giving it to this church. You're giving it to your high priest. It's given to him, and his church represents him on earth. And so you are supporting the cause of Christ when you give your tithes, and you're giving your tithes to the Lord Jesus. So yes, in the New Testament, we are still to give tithes. And Christ receives those tithes. Then notice finally the permanence of Melchizedek. Not finally, I got one more. But note the permanence of Melchizedek, verse 8. Again, we see an illumination here. Those two words here and there. Here in that time when he wrote this, and the, Le the Levitical priesthood was still functioning. Human priests were receiving tithes. But there in the heavenlies, our high priest is receiving our tithes. If we fail to give our tithes to the Lord, we're robbing God. And, and folks, I, I can't candy coat this for any of you. I, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. If you don't give to God what he has commanded, you're robbing what belongs to God, and you're living under a curse. And that's not a good place to live. Let me give an illustration. Over in Joshua chapter 7, when Joshua was leading the Israelites into the land of Canaan to possess that land, God had given them that land, they were to go in and possess it. God would, would conquer their enemies and give them the land. The first city they came to was Jericho. You read about this in Joshua chapter 7. There would be many cities that they would have to, to conquer. And the first would be Jericho. God told them, do not take the spoils of Jericho. I get the first fruit. That is a biblical principle. God gets the first fruits. So the first fruits would be Jericho, right? And the spoils, the, the gold and silver, and all the treasures of Jericho was to go into the treasury of the Lord. It was consecrated unto God. They were told that before they went in. Well, you read about Achan. Achan coveted the silver and gold in a Babylonian garment, he took them and hid them in his tent. What happened? God judged the whole 
nation because of the sin of this one man. Achan robbed God. Those who take that which has been consecrated to God make themselves accursed. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 19, that was brought out. It was consecrated unto the Lord. Anybody that took that which was consecrated to the Lord, verse 18, there would be a curse upon them. Achan didn't believe that. And he took that which had been consecrated to God. When he was found out, when he was exposed, note the consequences of what Achan did. There's four consequences. Number one, it brought dishonor upon his God. Number two, it brought defeat to his brethren. Because after the victory of Jericho, the next city they went against was the little city of Ai. Not the big city like Jericho, a little bitty city. They thought, well, we'll have no trouble with that. But they were soundly defeated at Ai. And God showed them it's because there's sin in the camp. That's why you were defeated. That's when they discovered that Achan had taken what had been consecrated to God. It brought defeat to his brethren. Folks, that's still true today. Church members who robbed God bring defeat upon their church. Their church cannot do what it would be able to do if all the members gave as God commanded us to give. Number three, it brought disgrace upon his family. You'll notice that Joshua 7, 1, says Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah. See, he drags his family through the mud when he does this. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, they are all mentioned. They didn't rob God, but because Achan did, he drags his whole family through the mud and brings disgrace upon his family. Then number four, he brought death to his children. Not only was Achan stoned to death, the Bible says his whole family was taken into this valley and stoned to death. Now, Dad, I would think twice about robbing God just for the sake of your family. Because your family can suffer the consequences of you having to live under a curse because you take what has been consecrated unto God. Those children die because of what Daddy did. Daddy robbed God. The Bible says the iniquity of the fathers will be visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Many times people suffer for the actions of their parents. So it's a grievous sin. Our high priest receives our tithe. Let's not rob him of what belongs to him. What has been consecrated to him, we should give. And we should do it gladly. Amen. Then note finally the primacy of Melchizedek. The entire Aaronic priesthood is shown to be of a lesser order than that of Melchizedek. So Christ is not of the inferior priesthood. He is of the superior priesthood, that of Melchizedek. So again, he's telling these folks, you're going to have to leave that old Levitical, Aaronic priesthood behind, but folks, you're getting something much better. That was true of everything. Everything they had to give up in the old Judaistic religion was replaced with something better. We're going to go on and see more about this in the chapters to come in our study of Hebrews. Why go back to something that's inferior? with something better has taken its place. In the Lord Jesus Christ, folks, we have a supreme, sovereign high priest. Acknowledged by no less a person than Abraham himself when he honored Melchizedek. How we should honor and exalt 
that holy name of Jesus Christ. There's no other name above that name. We should give him our best. He doesn't deserve our leftovers, folks. He deserves our very best. The best of your treasures, the best of your time, the best of your talents. He deserves it. I want to ask those that are going to be baptized, you go ahead and go to the back of Melody and Dakota. And while they're getting ready for baptism, uh, I'm going to ask our musician and song leader to come. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. But let me say this, because I know some visitors are here, and I want you to understand, Jesus is not your high priest until you're saved. More than a high priest, you need a Savior. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You might say, well, preacher, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? There's a man in the Bible that asked that question, and Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain that. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's got a twofold meaning. First of all, you've got to believe with the noggin. You've got to believe with the head, the fat. The Bible says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is his death, burial, and resurrection. To be saved, you've got to believe that Jesus is God the Son. That he came from heaven, became a man like us, lived a perfect sinless life, voluntarily went to the cross, and gave himself a sacrifice to pay our sin debt. He died on the cross for our sin. He was buried, and three days later he was resurrected and ascended back to heaven where he sits on the right hand of God as our high priest and our mediator. Now, you've got to believe that to be saved. Do I believe most of it? No, you've got to believe all of it. That's still not enough. Not only a head belief, also there is a heart belief. So you've got to believe the facts, but then also Accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, into your soul, into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. Because, folks, listen, you can believe with the head and not believe with the heart. The demons believe and tremble, James said. The, the demons believe everything the Bible says about Jesus. But he's not their Savior, he's not their savior because their Lord and Master is Satan. They're following Satan. They believe all the right things about Jesus, but they don't trust Jesus. Men can be the same shape. You can believe all the right things and yet stop short of trusting Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, and asking Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. I know people, they believe airplanes can fly, but they won't get on one. There may be some here. We could get you on an airplane for a love of money. You know they fly. You believe up here, but you don't trust them. You could be that way with Christ. To be saved, you must believe in the heart. 